Hello and welcome to Dove Biology 8's Lessons to Go. In this video, we'll be exploring speciation, extinction, and biodiversity. When it comes to biological evolution, there are two general types. They are microevolution and macroevolution. Microevolution are the small genetic changes that occur in a population over time. This may be the result of emigration. As individuals leave a population, they're going to take their genes with them. Or it could be the result of immigration, new individuals coming in and bringing their genes, thusly changing that uh, genetic makeup of that population. It may be the result of selective factors in which one characteristic is favored over another. And as a result, we see a shift in phenotypes as that gene pool changes uh, to those that are more favored. Typically, microevolution is something that can occur over a few generations, which means it's something we can actually observe within our lifetimes. The term macroevolution, on the other hand, is to describe the large-scale evolutionary changes that take place over time, in which new species are going to be formed from ancestral ones, and then others will be lost as a result of extinction. And typically, uh, especially with organisms that reproduce uh, at slower rates, we're not going to be able to see a lot of macroevolution within our own lifetimes. So if we're talking about the formation of new species in macroevolution, we need to actually know what we mean by a species. Around 1700, biologist John Ray proposed a general definition of a species, which we pretty much use today. The basic definition of a species is a group of interbreeding organisms that can produce fertile offspring in nature. In other words, these organisms can reproduce together, and then their offspring can also reproduce and make offspring. When it comes to our common everyday dog, um, despite the fact that they all look very different from each other, they're all members of the same species because they can breed together and produce that fertile offspring. Whereas a cat is going to be a different species from the dogs because they can't breed together. Cats breed with cats and dogs breed with dogs. Now, our, there are some interesting sort of exceptions. Closely related organisms like tigers and lions or zebras and horses can interbreed with one another. They typically don't do this in nature, but only in captivity. The offspring, though, are unfortunately not fertile. As a result, we did not form a new species. We simply made a hybrid. Um, this infertility that we see is a barrier to the formation of new species, and that's one of the ways that uh, nature has been set up so that new species aren't forming willy-nilly out in the wild, that there's things that prevent that formation of new species. One of the explanations of this uh, comes if we take a look at what happens when a horse and a donkey reproduce. Horses have a diploid number of 64, where donkeys have a diploid number of 62. As a result of meiosis and the formation of haploid gametes, uh, the horse will have 32 chromosomes in their gamete, and uh, donkeys will have 31. During fertilization, uh, when the two haploid gametes fuse to create that first fertilized egg, the diploid number is actually going to be an odd number. And so, unfortunately, um, that's going to be very difficult to split evenly uh, in a meiotic event. And so, as a result, um, mules are typically not going to be able to interbreed and, and create new offspring. The formation of new species is a process known as speciation. Speciation occurs when members of similar populations no longer can interbreed to produce fertile offspring. There are many different mechanisms for speciation. We're going to focus on two here, allopatric speciation and sympatric speciation. Allopatric speciation occurs when uh, a physical barrier, a geographical barrier, is going to divide a population so that it can no longer interbreed. As a result of their long-time separation, when brought back together, if they're unable to reproduce, then speciation has taken place. 
A great example of allopatric speciation will be the Albert squirrel and the Kaibab squirrel um, of the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon acts as our physical, geographic barrier separating our two squirrel species. As a result, their gene pools have changed such that the Albert squirrel um, has a larger number of genes which uh, brings allows it to be a lighter color. Whereas the Kaibab squirrel, its gene pool favors that of a more darker color. When the two squirrels are brought together artificially, they are less likely to reproduce. So many scientists believe that speciation has occurred as a result of their long time separation. The second type of speciation is what we call sympatric speciation. Sympatric speciation occurs when formerly interbreeding organisms can no longer reproduce as a result of a reproductive barrier. Um, sim means together or same and patria refers to country. So they're right next to each other but there's something preventing them from reproducing. This could be something as simple as a change in mating rituals or a rate, a mating timing. So maybe one organism reproduces in the morning and another reproduces at night. And this acts as a barrier to their reproduction. There could be structural differences between the species um, that prevent them from mating. So even though they live right next to each other, they're in the same uh, place because they have uh, structures that are incompatible they're not going to be able to reproduce. Another reproductive barrier would be uh, if for some reason the sperm and egg no longer were compatible. Um, and so this would prevent them from reproducing. It would be a reproductive barrier. Now when we explore speciation, under certain conditions we're going to see particular patterns. One such pattern would be adaptive radiation. Adaptive radiation occurs when an ancestral species evolves into an array of species to fit new habitats as they radiate or move to those new environments. Uh, typically we see this uh, when a species moves from the mainland to new island habitats like in Hawaii with the honey creepers that we see here or the finches or Galapagos turtles that we would see in the Galapagos. Another pattern of speciation we may see would be coevolution. Coevolution would occur when you have species that are closely linked and they'll affect each other's evolution. Um, predator prey relationships oftentimes exhibit this. As um, a prey species maybe becomes, uh, has an adaptation which allows it to run faster, this becomes a selective factor for the prey. And so only the prey that can run as fast are going to be able to survive um, to be able to keep up with those uh, prey species and reproduce. Um, additionally, we may see coevolution with pollen producers and pollinators. Um, as structures change on uh, pollen producers, only those pollinators which have compatible structures are able to survive and reproduce. So how long does the process of speciation take? Well, one idea is that it takes a really long time, and this is known as gradualism. With gradualism, there's going to be small changes that have adaptive value that are going to build up over time until new species forms. One uh, criticism of this viewpoint is that we would see then in the fossil record evidence of these uh, intermediate changes. And unfortunately, in the fossil record, there are large gaps. So more recently, a gentleman by the name of Stephen Jay Gould proposed an alternative hypothesis known as punctuated equilibrium. With punctuated equilibrium, the idea is, is that a species stays at equilibrium. It isn't changing very much until uh, particular points in time, maybe several thousand years, a uh, little point of time that we're going to have quick bursts of change. So in that one little series of time, we're going to have quick bursts followed by long periods of stability. Most evolutionary biologists actually think that it's a combination of the two and that some species are probably um, evolving through the result of gradualism, while others may um, be as a result of punctuated equilibrium. 
Now, with modern scientists in the 21st century, we're actually blurring the lines between species and speciation. What normally takes millions of years to take place, we can do very quickly in a laboratory, um, taking genes from one organism and putting it into another. While potentially useful, we have to be really careful to protect our natural genetic diversity from contamination. Um, and we have to be careful because um, what nature has meant to take millions of years, we're changing very rapidly and we don't know how that's going to impact uh, the future genetic diversity of our organisms. Now, kind of the opposite of speciation is extinction. Extinction occurs when organisms are not adapted to a particular environmental change and as a result they die out or go extinct. Uh, for example, the golden toad of Costa Rica um, in the Monte Verde cloud forest has actually become extinct as a result of changes in the climate. Now, there are different types of extinction. Um, there's background extinction, which is occurring all the time. Um, organisms are, are slowly going extinct as a result to changes in the environment or different ecological factors. And then sometimes we'll have mass extinctions. We'll have this rapid extinction of many organisms as a result of a catastrophic event in time. We've had several major uh, extinction events. Probably the largest is the one that you've heard least about, and that took, took place at the end of the Permian period. Um, over 90% of animal families, um, including 95% of marine species, went extinct as a result of uh, changes in the environment at the end of the Permian period. The most famous, of course, is going to be the KT extinction, uh, which took place at the end of the Cretaceous, and that involved the extinction of the dinosaurs. There are a lot of natural causes for extinction. Environmental changes can affect the ability of a species to survive. The movement of the Earth's tectonic plates, um, as those continents moved to new areas, uh, the environments were changing. And so if the species was not already adapted to those new environments, then they had to go extinct. Um, species that have limited range that are uh, affected by volcanoes or earthquakes can wipe out a species. Over the course of geologic time, uh, there's been major shift in the Earth's climate, and these major climatic shifts have led to extinction of organisms that were not adapted to these environments. And then, of course, we've had some major uh, catastrophic events like asteroids and meteorites that hit the Earth um, that you know led to the extinction of organisms like um, the dinosaurs, for example. Many scientists believe that we're currently experiencing a sixth major extinction. The idea is, is that human activities uh, that are changing environments, affecting the climate, um, are decreasing our Earth's overall biodiversity and that we're actually experiencing a major mass extinction event. There's an acronym that helps us to identify the major ways that humans are impacting biodiversity so that we can not only recognize uh, those impacts, uh, we can actually try to do something um, to counteract them. And that acronym is HIPPO, H-I-P-P-O. The first H stands for habitat destruction and degradation. Um, by destroying uh, organisms' habitats, they have no place to live, no place to obtain their nutrients, and so there's a great chance that they would go extinct. Um, the Yangtze River dolphin is one of the first major mammal species to go extinct um, in modern times as a result of habitat destruction. I stands for invasive species. Um, either purposefully or accidentally introducing species will impact the native organisms in that environment. We, in Virginia, we've had a lot of tree species impacted by insects and fungus that have been um, introduced into our um, ecosystems. P stands for pollution. The second P for population, human population growth. As human populations increase, our need for land for 
resources increases, so we're going to increase our habitat destruction, but we'll also um, perhaps be harvesting um, organisms for um, their food. And then that leads us to O, which is for over-exploitation. As we take more and more organisms from the wild for food and for clothing, uh, for medicine, we're going to find ourselves reducing that overall biodiversity. Speciation minus extinction equals biodiversity. The planet's genetic raw material for future evolution in response to changing environmental conditions. In this long term give and take between extinction and speciation, mass extinctions temporarily reduce biodiversity. However, they also create evolutionary opportunities for surviving species to undergo adaptive radiations to fill unoccupied and new biological roles or niches.